Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. This is episode 40 and I'm your host, Harry Simeon. Don't forget this show is sponsored by loserpool.com, a fantastic new betting game that you can get involved in. Some brilliant offers, fantastic discounts available going into the Christmas period. So do head over to loserpool.com and check it out. Now, before we get into it this week, uh, on behalf of everybody involved with the Chronicles of Aguna podcast, I'd like to send our best wishes out to a very good friend and a colleague over at the same old Arsenal, Mr. Graham Brooks. Uh, Graham's mum's been taken unwell, unfortunately. Um, so our thoughts and prayers are, are with you and your family at this difficult time, Graham. Everybody who's ever watched you on any podcast or any of your videos will know what a great... Um, tactical mind you have and and how passionate you are about this football club uh, so on behalf of all of us we'd like to send you our best wishes and we wish your mum a speedy recovery now on this week's episode we'll be looking back at the disappointing defeat at st mary's the end of our unbeaten run we'll be hearing from hugh Wizzy, and there are contributions from mystic mems chris davison and mike stavrou what a show this is going to be so make sure you stay tuned right until the very end hit the like button if you're watching on youtube hit the subscribe button if you're watching on youtube and of course do the same on whatever audio platform it may be that you're listening from uh, we really really appreciate the support and the reviews and and your interaction on social media it's been brilliant uh, so thank you and, and please do keep it up Right, so as always, I'm going to start off by sharing my thoughts on the weekend's game. A disappointing defeat at St. Mary's, uh, the end of our unbeaten run. I guess I remembered what it feels like to lose a game. Uh, that's something that I never thought I'd be saying at the start of the season. I never thought we'd go on a 22 uh, game unbeaten run. So hats off to Unai Emery and his team. Um, you know, the results speak for themselves. And, and it's as a result of that, it's very important, isn't it, that we don't overreact having lost at Southampton. Um, I think the timing of going to Southampton probably couldn't have been worse. Ralph Hasenhutl taking over, um, a manager with a very good reputation, uh, dubbed as the sort of uh, uh, of Austria's answer to Jurgen Klopp, is, is what they call him, uh, led RB Leipzig to second in the Bundesliga when he was there. Um, so he's obviously a manager with pedigree, um, and, and he really did get the best out of this Southampton team, didn't he? They were re-energized, revitalized, and, and that's something that you couldn't say under Mark Hughes. They looked sluggish, they looked lackluster, they looked really down in the dumps, down on confidence, and, and I guess that's why he's lost his job. But that's enough about Southampton. Let's talk about Arsenal, and I want to start off by talking about the team selection. Um, Unai Emery chose to line up as follows. Burned Leno in goal, a back three of Licksteiner, Koscielny, and Granit Xhaka. Then Bellerin and Monreal in the fullback positions or wingback positions. Torreira Guendouzi in the centre of midfield with Mikitarian and Iwobi supporting Pierre Emerick Abamyang. Our subs bench was made up of Petr Cech, El Neni, Ramsey, Lacazette, Erzil, Maitland Niles, and Eddie and Ketia. Now, I must admit, when I saw the team written on paper um, in the build up to the game, uh, I thought that. He had gone with a back four. I thought that Licksteiner and Koscielny were going to play as centre-backs with Monreal at left-back, Bellerin at right-back and Granit Xhaka starting in the midfield. I thought that made more sense. Um, that way you're only playing with one player out of position as opposed to two. Um, so, yeah, that's what I thought when I saw it on paper and I thought that would have probably been the right way to go. I know hindsight is a wonderful thing, but I just felt that giving the extra... Um, Putting, giving us, sorry, the extra man in midfield in Granit Xhaka would mean that we could dominate in that area of the pitch, which is, of course, a very important area. And that would kind of compensate for the fact that we only had um, a, a right back playing at centre back alongside a half fit central defender. Um, so I just felt that that was more logical, more sensible. And given that we've only really started playing with three at the back since Bournemouth, um, you know, I thought Emery would have a little more faith in the, in the team's ability to switch back to a back four, considering he's done that for most of the season and he's got away with it, hasn't he? He's got plenty of results playing that way. I just think to deploy a system that requires three centre-backs when you've only got one who's half fit um, just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It just doesn't make any sense. I suppose you could argue that maybe... 
Unai Emery wanted to play with the wing backs because we lack width in other areas of the team. Um, and all season, Hector Bellerin and Calas and actual Monreal, whoever it may be in that position, um, have been really effective getting forward and, and supporting the attacks, particularly in Kalasinac's case of late. Um, but I felt that the fullbacks or the wingbacks, sorry, on Sunday were, were a little bit more reluctant to get forward than they usually are. I don't know if that's because they had the fact they would be leaving Licksteiner and Jacker exposed in the back of their minds. Um, I, I don't know, but I just felt that Nacho Monreal was very hesitant to get forward. Um, and, and the one time he did, we ended up scoring from it. But he didn't do it often enough for me. He didn't do it um, as much as a Sead Kalasinac would. But again, is it because he was fearful of leaving Granite Xhaka exposed? I don't know what you guys think. Tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC and let me know. So Southampton took the lead on 20 minutes through Danny Ings' header. Um, he managed to find space in between the centre-backs um, and he punished us, didn't he? I thought that when the cross came in from Southampton's left, Arsenal's right, I felt that Lauren Koscielny misjudged the flight of the ball. Um, you know, it's very early in his recovery. I think under different circumstances, he wouldn't have been anywhere near the first team in a Premier League game. But but such was the situation that he had to be thrown in. Um, I think a Lauren Koscielny, a fit Lauren Koscielny, probably gets to that ball. Um not entirely sure why he opted to go with a, with a foot. He seemed to dangle a foot out, which looked impossible, um, as opposed to going with his head and, and maybe cutting that out. Um, it was a good cross. Uh, I'm not taking that away from Southampton. I just felt that Lauren Koscielny got caught underneath the ball um, and he looked a little bit rusty, didn't he? And, and I guess that's understandable. He's been out for a very long time. Yes, he played 70 minutes in the Europa League. He's made a couple of appearances for the under-23s, but that doesn't give you anywhere near the, the intensity that a, a Premier League game uh, like this, particularly away from home, against the Ralph Hasenhutl side, uh, will give you. So it, he can be forgiven, I think. Um, but for me, you know, defensive problems just over and over again. and They keep coming up, don't they? They keep biting us in the arse. And, and we don't seem to be improving a great deal um, defensively. Now, I, again, you know, I know, I know you're probably looking at this, um, listening to this video or uh, listening to the audio, whatever you're doing and screaming at me saying, but we had all of our defenders missing and I get that. But we're talking about basic concepts of defending and, and Arsenal 17 games into the season or whatever we are still haven't improved in that department. If you're asking me, um, that's my opinion. Happy for that to be challenged, of course. Tweet me at Chronicles underscore AFC. Let me know what you think. Um, but that Southampton lead was only to last for around about eight minutes. Um, it, it wasn't long before uh, we got ourselves back in the game. And, and, you know, Iwobi picked out a brilliant pass. Probably the only uh, brilliant pass that he picked out all evening, all afternoon, sorry, uh, if I'm being honest. But he found Nacho Monreal, who's cut back or cross, whatever you want to call it, was absolutely perfect. Um, it, it had the power on it. It had the accuracy. And all Mkhitaryan had to do, uh, in effect, was guide it on target. And he'd scored. And, and that's exactly what he'd done, the Armenian. He, he got us level um, just eight minutes after Southampton had taken the lead. And that goes back to the earlier point that I was making. When Nacho Monreal did get forward, it was effective. It just didn't happen often enough for me. And... I don't know why. The only thing I can think of is that maybe they were fearful of, of the gaps they were leaving behind them and the players that they were leaving exposed behind them. I think that's the only logical explanation, isn't it? Given the way Emery's put so much emphasis on his fullbacks getting forward, why all of a sudden did it re not really happen? Um, you know, I guess limitations uh, based on personnel available on the day. And, and you know, it is what it is. Um but frustratingly, right on half time, uh, we found ourselves 2 1 down. Again, what seemed like an insignificant, uh, far from dangerous piece of play led to a goal. It was another cross, this time from Nathan Redmond. It was a very good cross. It was more of a sort of chipped ball into the penalty area. Um, he done really well there to pick out Danny Ings again, who found himself in between Kashoni and Licksteiner. 
Now, Danny Ings' header was fantastic. I've seen some people on social media blaming Burned Leno for that one. I don't place any blame at his door um, in regards to that goal because it was one of those headers, wasn't it, that looks like it's going way off target and then it's just got a wicked dip on it, a wicked loop, and it just ended up in that corner. Um, but for me, if I'm being a, if I'm being critical here and I'm looking at, into this uh, goal with a fine tooth comb, I, I think that... Stefan Licksteiner has to do more um, to get in the way of Danny Ings. Now, Lauren Koscielny has been called out. The ball's gone over the top of his head. But Stefan Licksteiner can see the cross coming in. He's facing it. Um, you know, he can see the ball. He can see the man. He's he's looking that way. For me, he's got to come across and at least make it difficult for Danny Ings. Um, not saying he would have got there. Not saying he would have got anywhere near it. But... You need to read that. You need to anticipate that. And you need to get in the attacker's way. Um, and if anything, just put him off slightly. And you know what? If he scores, then you've done your bit. But in my opinion, Stefan Licksteiner probably should read that a little bit better, particularly a player of his experience. Yes, you're probably saying he's not a centre-back, and I get that. But again, these are basic concepts of defending. And, and you know, we're, we're lacking in that department, aren't we? Now, half-time came. Uh, Alexander Lacazette came on for Hector Bellerin, who's picked up a knock. Looks as though he's going to be out for two, three weeks, which is a huge blow um, because I don't know about you guys, but I'm not confident Stefan Licksteiner can do that job um, in the right wing back position uh, for a sustained period of time. I don't think he's got the fitness to get up and down anymore. And, and, you know, as we've been saying all season and as I've been saying on this show, that is a huge part of the way Unai Emery Arsenal play and, and to be without Hector Bellerin is a huge blow and it might force uh, Unai Emery to look at his fullback wing back options and, and, and maybe go and add someone to the ranks in the January transfer window who knows uh, but the break came uh, Laka came on um, and I thought that he was good when he came on I thought he gave us a, a real intensity up front um, in the forward positions he worked hard he hassled um, and he made things happen, didn't he? His willingness to press, um, him and Gwenduzi together pressed, I think, to win the ball back um, for our second equaliser of the afternoon. Um, eventually, the ball went to Mikitarian, whose tame effort, it has to be said, it looked like it was just trickling into the keeper's arms, took a wicked deflection, wrong-footing the goalkeeper. And Arsenal were back, uh, back on level terms, 2-2. And at that point... You felt as though the game was there to be won. You felt as though Arsenal were in the ascendancy. We'd made a couple of opportunities early on in the half. And you just got the impression that we were getting ready to go on and win this. You know, we were stepping it up a gear. But it didn't really happen. Um, it just, for whatever reason, it just didn't happen. Uh, Mesut Ozil came on for the last 20 minutes or so in the hope that, you know, he could engineer a chance or manufacture an opportunity for either one of our two strikers. But he didn't really have much impact and, and it is difficult to come on, particularly in a, in a game of that intensity with 20 minutes to go and, and get straight into it. Um, he didn't impress many people, it's safe to say. Lots of posts on social media shortly after calling for him to be sort of sold as soon as possible. Get mess it off our wage bill. We've, we're fed up of him. He's not producing and I get that argument. I do. He doesn't produce anywhere near often enough. Um, and, and I get that. But I still think he's a wonderful player. Um, you could have maybe questioned why when Imery didn't bring Aaron Ramsey on instead. I think that game would have suited Aaron Ramsey a lot more, uh, given he's a lot more physical. Uh, he plays with bursts of energy. He breaks into the penalty area and maybe his support would have been more useful to the likes of Lacazette and Aubameyang. But if we're picking on players, Aubameyang had a couple of opportunities, didn't he, um, at St Mary's, and he didn't take them. So I know he's had a good season overall, but if you're going to be overly critical of Mesut Ozil and others, then you need to be critical of Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang as well, because I thought he had a couple of really good opportunities this weekend, and he just didn't take them. And given how bad we are defensively, we have to be efficient in front of goal, don't we? We have to be, because... If if it's not for that, then we'll be miles behind because defensively we're a shambles. We're all over the place. I don't think that's news to anybody. Um, but at 2-2, I felt that only one side were going to win it, if any side were going to win it. And I thought that was us. I've got to be honest. 
Um, but 85 minutes played and uh, Southampton dealt us with a sucker punch, didn't they? Um, Shane Long, who'd come on as a substitute uh, to replace, I'm not sure who actually, I think Danny Ings went off for Charlie Austin, didn't he? Uh, who proved to be the match winner. But anyway, Shane Long had come on as a sub and he brought a bit of energy to the Southampton side, a side that looked wary, a side whose legs were beginning to get heavier and heavier as the, the time went on. And you just felt that if Southampton were going to do anything, it was going to come from him. And, and that's exactly what happened. He broke away. And as he was running sort of towards the Arsenal penalty area, what frustrated me was that from watching it on the TV, I could see what his intention was. You could see the way he was shaping his body, the way he slowed down, waiting for support to arrive. He had no intention of driving into the box alone. He had no intention of firing a shot goalwards. All he was interested in was standing the ball up at the far post. That was as clear as day. And so for me, Bernd Leno has to read that quicker. He has to do better. Long's chipped the ball towards the far post. Bernd Leno's come flying out like Superman. And not for the first time this season. It's not the first time that he's been caught on a cross. And he had a moment five, ten minutes before that um, in this game where he'd come flying out for a cross and he got nowhere near it. So the warning signs were there, but Bernd Leno, if you're not going to get there, you cannot come. It's as simple as that. Um, you know, you've got to be sure in that situation. If he stays on his line and Charlie Austin wins the header, then Charlie Austin has to beat him. And the fact is, Charlie Austin was coming from an unfavourable angle um, and it's got to be some header to beat a goalkeeper from there. But what Leno has essentially done is, is sold himself, uh, flown out like a madman and given Charlie Austin the easiest of finishes. All he has to do is nod it on target and he scored because the goalkeeper's in no man's land and we just made it easy for him. And, and that was really frustrating for me. Um, I, I think as a striker, you know, that that is exactly what you want, isn't it? It's just easy pickings. And, you know, if you can't stop a situation, if you can't always get there then at least make it as difficult for your opponent as possible and Arsenal didn't do that um tonight uh sorry yesterday and and that really really disappointed me so um yeah I, I must admit my heart sank when Southampton scored because I felt we should have won it and, and we didn't we we completely bottled it um and and you know and all the weaknesses that have shown over these past few weeks months they came back to bite us in the ass uh today and it's no surprise, is it? You can't keep uh, only turning up for half a match each week and expect to get away with it. Eventually, it was going to catch up with us. And unfortunately, on Sunday, it did. So just to quickly summarise, um, I would say that that result has been coming for quite some time. Um, you know, other than the Spurs game, I think we've been poor for quite a while now. I don't think there's been any improvement uh, under Unai Emery defensively. Uh, I have to stress that defensively before uh, people start getting on my back. I don't think there has been. Um, so, yeah, that's that's just my feelings on it. I think Unai Emery got it wrong against Southampton. Uh, does it mean that I want him sacked? Of course it doesn't. Um, I just feel that right now the environment around Arsenal is a strange one. Because we wanted Arsene Wenger out so badly, People are scared to criticise the new manager. And I don't think that's right. I think you should be able to reflect on a game and, and point out mistakes um, and, and talk about them as long as it's done respectfully. Uh, I'm not standing in the ground effing and blinding at Unai Emery or calling for him to get the chop. I just feel that he's made a few mistakes this season. I've said it on previous podcasts and, you know, shoot me if if it's such a bad thing. I just That's just the way I feel. Um, and that's what it's all about, isn't it? Opinions. I felt we really missed Sayed Kalasinac. I've spoken a lot about the, the wing backs. Um, and, you know, Kalasinac is just more of a forward thinking wing back than Nacho Monreal is. Uh, we were unfortunate to lose him the day before in training. Uh, so hopefully that injury is not too serious. We don't know any further details at the time of recording, but hopefully he can come back as soon as possible. I just think that had Granit Xhaka played in centre midfield, um, and we'd gone with a back four. I honestly believe that we would have dominated the most important area of the pitch, played on the front foot and, and probably created a lot more uh, and really taken the game to Southampton. 
as I've already said, you can't keep getting away with turning up for just half a fixture. Um, Lauren Koscielny, hard to criticise him. Uh, look, he wasn't ready to play. It showed, and he was just a victim of circumstance against Southampton. So uh, no point in really uh, having a go at him or, or digging into that particular argument because I don't think there is one really. Um, last thing I want to say it is on Mesut Ozil. Read loads of stuff uh, about him uh, in the aftermath of this game. People calling for him to be sold. Uh, people saying that that was the final straw. They've had enough of him. He did try a dummy um, and lost the ball. He didn't really work hard enough to get it back. And Southampton went and scored down the other end. But I, I think that's a bit harsh. I don't think that you can blame him for that goal. I think you've got to blame Bernd Leno for that. Um, I think it is hard to, to come into a game late on and, and try and make an impact on it, particularly in a physical game like that. So I'm not too fussed about Mesa Ozil's performance, if I'm honest. Um, yeah, I don't think that one deserves the airtime that it's been getting uh, since the game finished. So I, I think we'll park that for now. I'm going to take a short break. And when I return, I'll be joined by Hugh Wizzy. And we'll also be hearing later on in the show from Mike Stavrou, Chris Davison and Mystic Mems. So uh, stay tuned. Joining me on the line this week is the brilliant Hugh Wizzy. Hugh, welcome to the Chronicles of Aguna, mate. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Uh, pleasure to be here, mate. Thanks very much for inviting me. No problem at all. No and problem that, at all. And that fantastic introduction as well. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's, it's deserved, though. It is deserved. Come on. Um, Hugh, just uh, touching on yesterday's game. Disappointing defeat at the hands of Southampton. Um, the unbeaten run has come to an end. I want to start off by getting your thoughts on the initial team selection. Is there anything that you would have done differently? I know hindsight is a wonderful thing, but just looking at that starting lineup that Unai Emery went with, was you in total agreement with it or was there some changes you may have made? I don't think it's the first time that we could have all said we don't really agree with Unai Emery's team selection going into the game. However, we've been getting... You know, the results by way of this second half performance continuously, and that is largely in part due to the changes that he's made. So, yeah, I look at the side, and again, I thought it's very defensive. Um, for a team like Southampton to, you know, be playing us right now, it's, it's quite unlucky as well. We've caught them with, you know, a lot of energy and enthusiasm the new manager and they'll all be playing for their places and feeling like they can go places because he's a very inspirational guy who's got results elsewhere um but yeah the team selection you know i think it's not really his fault largely in part due to the the injuries that we've got and uh I, I guess a couple of things that are going on behind the scenes that we don't all know the full details of whether it's you know ramsey or us you want to touch on it's it's down to him to make the decisions. It's it's a uh, it's a question of whether we really are putting faith in him and trusting him. And I, I'm doing that so far. And you know he's been getting it right. So as much as I I looked at the team sheet and I thought mm, I'm not sure, and we've come away without any points. You know it, we have uh, been on a sensational run, and I don't think you can be too down about that. Um, but yeah. Uh, in particular, I thought we missed Kalasinac. I don't know about you, but uh, yeah. on the left-hand side, I thought his, his uh, strength going forward especially was really missed. We lacked a, a kind of uh, a focal point and um, that physicality that he brings as well. Yeah, can't disagree with you there. I've said it sort of earlier on in the show. He was a huge miss. Um, speaking of someone who did play, Laurent Koscielny was, in my opinion, rushed back. He, he did look a bit rusty, didn't he? He did indeed, but, you know, again, I can't really fault the guy too much. He has been thrown to the Lions slightly, um, like you said, rushed back, because basically there are no other options, um, apart from going, I guess, to the youth, which I guess a, a lot of people have been calling for. Um, but yeah, it looks like it was a, a bad decision in hindsight, and that we're definitely going to need to go into the January transfer window with an eye on 
bringing in reinforcements, um, not only as a centre back, but also a kind of wide striker. So I'm going to replace um, Danny Welbeck. Um, but yeah, a centre back in particular, especially if, you know, Koscielny is going to be continually breaking down or is finished, um, or if Mavropanos is going to be taking much longer as well, because I thought he looked so promising. Yeah, again, completely agree. But what does it say to some of the youth players? For example, Medley, who got a game the other night in the Europa League. Um, he got onto the pitch and then you go into a Premier League game with no centre-halves fit, pretty much one half fit one. And he still doesn't get a look in, not even a place on a bench for him. How would that make you feel as a youth player? Is that not something well, that could get you down? You know, Harry, Harry, you have to be, you have to look at this with a, uh... A broader perspective in my eyes, because the, the the easy argument is to be like, you know, okay, we've got this guy, he looks promising, that's just pushing through, but at the same time, you've got a new manager whose life is on the line every game he goes into. His reputation is being built every minute that they play. So I can totally understand why he would rather go with an experienced international who's captain aside for plenty of years. You know, he's he's been a leader for us and I know it didn't go right, but I can totally understand the decision because although, you know, maybe he's looked like he's ready or very close to being ready to at least being given a chance in the Premier League, um, we're basing that on what? A very small, you know, a, a small amount of game time yeah. against a side who are, you know, not up to Premier League standard, you could argue. And, certainly for for us anyway, the game really had less meaning to it. So it's a bit of a training exercise. It's a process. So, you know, I totally get why Emery did that. Yeah, I, I get where you're coming from. And, and I personally probably wouldn't have thrown him in either. I just think that in the situation where you don't have any fit centre-halves, to turn your nose up at a centre-half who you had faith to to pick in the Europa League a few days earlier. It just doesn't make sense for me, at least a place on the bench. You know, we, we didn't have a single uh, real defensive option on the bench on, on, on Saturday, Sunday, sorry, did we? And and so that's the only sort of basis for the argument, I guess. Um, Matteo Guendouzi, what are your thoughts on him, Hugh? Um, because he's been getting a lot of, of sort of praise throughout the season. I still think he's really raw and I still think he's not quite ready uh, to start week in, week out for the Arsenal. What have you made of his uh, start to life uh, at the Emirates? Um, I just, it just, sorry to just um, go back to the last question very briefly. Right? It's made me think something that you just said. Of, uh, yeah. That is perhaps why Emery was so defensive. You know, he realised that we're so short on, on cover and... You know, creativity becomes a second kind of, of second secondary importance when you've you know you're lacking in every, almost every position and people are dropping like flies over the last two three games. We just had people just dropping out, so I can totally understand that. As far as Guendouzi goes, um, I actually think that uh, you know I love the kids. Right? I really warmed to the kid, especially during the North London derby where yeah. he showed himself to be one of us and was standing up for the badge, his players, his friends, the family. I love that. So I'm fully in on Guendouzi. I think it's a great project, but I do think that we've given him a little bit too much responsibility. And that, you know, I've said this from the first day of the season, that it's asking a lot of a kid to, you know, we, we, we genuinely played him against Manchester City, against arguably, you know, one of the best teams in the world that, bullied him in certain situations or took advantage of him in certain situations and he is a, start, a slight liability but he also does offer such directness such confidence on the ball and the ability to win fouls by getting his body in front of everything very clever on the ball that he shows enough potential to kind of want to risk it and as we're going through a period which is you know, we're kind of, I don't think Emery really knows what his best first eleven is just yet. I don't think it's such a bad thing that he's getting game time. And, you know, that is what Arsenal are about as well. Um, giving opportunities to youth players and not necessarily needing to spend ridiculous amounts of money to prove that, you know, you can do it at the top level. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Hugh, where do you stand on the, the Mesa Ozil debate? Um, you know, he was dropped from the team against Bournemouth because Unai Emery said that he wanted more physicality in the side. Um, then he went off sort of injured with a back problem that we've heard quite a bit about in the last couple of years. It has to be said. Um, there's a lot of Arsenal fans that are sick and tired of him, fed up of him, want him out the door, want him off the wage bill. I'm not one of those people. Um, I really appreciate what a good player he is. Um, but where do you stand on the sort of Mesut Ozil debate in general? It's a difficult one, Harry. It really is a difficult one. And I, I say that as someone who loves Mesut. I've, you know, I've been a massive advocate of everything he does. And it's not a good situation that we're in, basically, because ultimately he's costing us too much money for what he's offering. Those are the facts. And currently, I don't think as once was the case under Wenger, that he is kind of the most, you know, the centrifugal part of the cog. He's not the he's not the most influential player at the club right now. Yeah. And whilst he's certainly got the most ability on his day, um, it just isn't a side that's going to be built around him right now, especially if he's inconsistent with, you know, availability never mind actually performance uh, performance wise so when you look at the way that emery is building the side it is clear that he is all about going wide getting it wide some of his most important pieces have been granite jacker for example yeah. or your wide men in kalastanac or iwobi or you know it's not ever looking like he needs that number 10 that Ozil really, you know, wants to play in, um, or at least it's sparingly. And it's, it's for me, it's weird because I, I look at the football sometimes that we're playing and I'm, I'm genuinely not convinced by it at times. It doesn't seem like the most, you know, certainly not the most pleasing to watch. However, it is getting results. Yeah, The fitness of the side has certainly improved and that physicality that he said he needs has been provided by probably the main difference and the signing of the season for me in Torreira, yep. who is, you know, he is embodying everything that Arsenal have lacked. He is showing everyone what everyone wanted to see, basically. He, you know, he's good on the ball. He can shoot, take free kicks, corners. He wins the ball back. When he loses it, he goes and gets it back. He's always in the right position. There's lots of good things to say about this guy. So much so that he is probably becoming the most influential player at the club, the most important piece. And, you know, whilst Ozil is kind of creating headlines or in the headlines for the wrong reasons a lot of the time these days, more people will question him, especially because he's on so much money. Yeah, I don't know how much it is, but I think it's like over three hundred and thirty grand a week. Now, the team as a whole can move forward probably more in Emery's eyes, I reckon, if we were to, you know, find a solution, find an alternative solution. The thing is that you've got Ramsey as a problem as well, and I really don't know how quickly Arsenal would be able to replace both of them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the way that it's going, I can see that, you know, Ramsey's basically gone. Um, I can't say what I've heard, but there's a club that's been mentioned, basically. Yeah. And that looks like that's happening. So then you've, <laughs> you've basically got a situation on your hands where you have a player who, you know, he is an entity unto himself, extremely marketable, huge in terms of like social media and all the things that he brings. But on the pitch, what he's offering is probably, you know, less than what we're paying for right now. Yeah. If that changes, then I think we've fully got to keep him on board because he's one of the best in the world with what he does. Yeah, um, totally agree. And but, I think uh, you know, it's a lot to do with, see how Emery deals with it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think it's a lot down to um, maybe restrictions that will be placed on Unai Emery when he looks to recruit in the summer if he does keep um, these type of players. Because obviously they're taking up a huge proportion of the wage bill in Mesut Ozil's case. And I think that part of the reason that Aaron Ramsey's not staying is because Unai Emery's probably been told that, you know, if you give him this contract, 
you will be limited in what you can spend in bringing in your own players. And I think that's played a huge part. And and in the case of both of them, they're a massive financial strain on the club. Um, Ozil now and Ramsey in the future if he was to stay. So I guess from that point of view, you can see where Unai Emery's coming from if he was to to pull the plug on both of them. Um, this is the, the first transfer window that we're going to see what Stan is really like as a, you know, the sole owner of the club. Yeah. And also with, you know, um, with a new head of, of, of business, uh, a new Raul, you know, this is all these, all these guys first transfer window doing their thing on their own, I guess, really. So it will be, uh, all action or stations, I would imagine. And yeah, I can, I can put two and two together basically and see that Ramsey situation that you just described being just like that. Yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense. I mean, looking ahead to Spurs on on Wednesday night, how do you think Unai Emery will approach the the fixture given the hectic December schedule? Do you think the defeat at the weekend will have affected his thinking going into this one? I think it has to, really. Um, You know, this is a competition that I think he wants to win, but... um, you can't say that it's going to be a priority, and if there are, if there is a way of us avoiding any further risk, damage limitation is definitely going to be a priority because this is a busy period now. But um, obviously, it's another massive game. I'm going to be there myself. I'm expecting a win. Uh, <laughs> however, yeah, we're kind of limited on what we've got now, really, um, and. I think he'll have to bring in a couple of youngsters. Um, but, you know, that's always the case of this competition, isn't it? So, it's not a bad thing. What about in terms of a prediction, Hugh? Where, where are you sitting on that? Would you A prediction? It's going yeah. to kick off again, man. It's going to kick <laughs> off again. Um, I can see yellow cards. I'm thinking six yellow cards. <laughs> um, Gwendozi and, you know... All of them who were involved in that that clash, who were there or on the pitch, are going to be playing with an extra fire in their belly. And you know those those youngsters like Mendy that you talked about, Sako, they're all going to be hoping that they can be involved or trying to prove a point. It should be exciting, man. You know these these competitions are underrated. The the tickets are cheap. Um, you know it's a family atmosphere, but on the pitch you've got people that are fighting for their careers you know? that's right and as much as um you know we we kind of look at it like uh the worst of the trophies or whatever to them it's a massive opportunity so i look forward to it yeah me too and it'll be interesting to see how Maurizio pochettino approaches it because he's traditionally sort of turned his nose up at the cup competitions um obviously champions league qualification is a priority for spurs given they've just built this mega new stadium which i have to say i don't like to say it but it does look amazing um they they will have you seen have you seen the way that that you can get when you order a beer no i've not i've not it pours it it pours itself from the bottom it's why you kind of click the 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 pint glass over this kind of funnel and it pours you a pint from the bottom it's mad oh wow it looks crazy but listen that's all irrelevant you haven't won anything come back when you have (laughs) yeah that i don't know why he why he can't find it himself to prioritize that competition because it's the one that they're most likely to win yeah um and i don't know i think people would respect him a lot more if he did win something yeah. I think there are I think there are plenty of Tottenham fans out there who are screaming out for them to just win anything. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. I just think that given they were building the stadium and we know firsthand the financial strain it can put on a club, I think that Tottenham's objective would have been to keep making the Champions League, keep getting that money in through the door um, in order to help with this project. So I, I can see sort of both sides of it, but I totally agree with you. Until they win something, they can't be talking about a power shift or anything like that. Um, so we'll just uh, put that talk to one side. Um, Hugh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join me. I know you're really busy and we really, really appreciate you coming on. Do you want to let our listeners know how they can follow you on social media? Uh, absolute pleasure having me on. Um and 
yeah, you can find me on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash QWizzy or youtube.com forward slash QWizzy. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much. And we hope to speak to you uh, again very soon. Yeah. Happy Christmas, you and uh, everyone. Cheers, mate. That was the brilliant Hugh Wizzy. Thank you very much to Hugh for joining me on this edition. Now we're going to hear from another Arsenal fan, a regular on the show, Mike Stavry. We're going to be hearing his thoughts on uh, the disappointing result. Here's what Mike had to say. Here's his reaction to the game. Southampton 3, Arsenal 2, really disappointing game from an Arsenal perspective. Defensively shoddy, Lauren Koscielny coming back into the side, clearly wasn't ready for this game, clearly wasn't up for it, no fault of his own. I mean, the fact that we have six defenders from that game, you know, suspended or injured with Stefan Lichstein and Hector Bellerin both coming off with injuries, it didn't bode well, to be honest. Playing Granit Xhaka at centre-back, you know I'm not a big fan of him, even less so at centre-back. I actually thought he didn't have a bad game, actually. But um, just Lauren Koscielny in that centre was not was not positionally aware. I think he was at fault for, for both goals. And then obviously the third goal, uh, Bernd Leno. He's got that in his locker. What, what else can I say? You know, he's a great shot stopper. Made a great save, actually, from Maya Yoshida um, to, to keep us in it. But then, you know, not long later, concedes an abs- absolute howler. And um, it's just his decision-making that's not quite there. And you have to think with someone like Petrček waiting in the wings... When does it ever get to a point where he makes so many mistakes that cost us points like this? Is Czech going to eventually come back into it? The only reason that Leno did get into the side, of course, is because Czech was injured. Um, But I think Emery has established him as his number one because of his passing ability. So we'll see what happens on that front, especially I think Emery's got a few decisions to make with personnel, such as um, Mesa Ozil came on in the second half, was quite ineffective, to be honest. Um, didn't really look like he knew where he was playing um, and also he was at fault for the goal, gave it away, didn't track back, you know, in typical Ozil style. It'll be interesting to see how Emery handles his situation because he's obviously just become, you know, the highest played player at the club and in the league, £350,000 a week. What do we kind of do with that? You know, if he's not starting, I know he's reportedly had a bit of a back problem, but if he's not going to be our most integral player, how can we afford to keep him around, you know? And it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. But I think people need to take it, as I said, with a pinch of salt. 22 games unbeaten. Anyone would have taken it, you know, after that after that horrible start we had with Man City and Chelsea. Two losses there. And Emery's done a fantastic job. I think Arsenal fans have a lot to be positive about. And I have a lot to be positive about. Moving forward, you know, we need to get back on a run, get back with our momentum and just see this as a bit of a setback. And if anything, I think Emery might be, you know, a little bit intrigued to see how they do react because that's what's important, you know. It's not always going to go well. You're not always going to get the results. Um, I think a few results recently were papering over cracks. We weren't particularly that good. Ended up getting results. But let's see what happens. We go on to the next game against Spurs. That's the big one. If we can make it 2-0 and um, in the last two, you know, I'm going to be happy. Also sharing his thoughts is football reporter Chris Davis, and here's what he had to say uh, following the weekend's game. Hi, everyone. I hope you're all doing okay. I'm sure most of you are all still disappointed by yesterday's result, as am I. I think looking back at it, we've got to be honest and and admit Southampton were the better side and and wanted it more. Um, You know, I think with the, the, the new manager they have in charge now and a good manager, um, the home fans behind them, uh, and obviously they'll they'll be wanting to pick up as many points as possible um, to fight their way back up the table, especially at home. Uh, I, I said before yesterday's game, it, it was never going to be an easy ninety minutes to get through, and indeed, it, it, you know, it wasn't. You know, Southampton played well, always dangerous going forward, and caused our defence many problems. And I think our defence was another factor to yesterday. Some mistakes in there, and. Um, you know, it's never going to be an easy ask with the injuries and suspensions we have at the moment. So, yeah, it's a wake-up call, isn't it, for both the manager and for the team um, after our 22-game unbeaten run. It was nice whilst it lasted, but, you know, <laughs> just goes to show not every game is easy. And um, yesterday certainly wasn't. I think um, 
I, I'm not. I'm definitely not going to dwell on it too much. And I, I, that's what I'll say to most of you as well. Try not to dwell on it too much. I know it's disappointing after our good run of form, but I would have never have thought we'd go on a 22 game unbeaten run with a new manager in charge in his first season. Um, you know, and working with a squad that would be developing and learning constantly under a new manager in Unai Emery. It's not easy, but we've we've proved that it, you know we've got a good squad here, a good manager. Um, who are all working very hard in trying to get the club moving forward. And I have seen improvements this season. But obviously yesterday, and obviously the first two games of the season, which I know was obviously still early doors, just goes to show that there's still a lot of work to be done. But I fully trust only I am Reece the man to, to, to take us forward, to improve us. And um, yeah, hopefully we can fight back and get the, get the win against the Spuds on Wednesday. That would be the perfect response. And last but not least, uh, Mems, Mystic Mems, as he's known on Twitter, was kind enough to send through his thoughts as well, uh, following on from the disappointing defeat. Here's what Mems had to say. And and just before I play uh, Mems' voice clip, I've got to say, uh, he did call Mkhitaryan to score before the game. That's why they call him Mystic Mems. Uh, spot on once again. Uh, so here's uh, his voice note. Uh, reacting again to... Uh, yeah, I know I keep saying it, but a disappointing defeat. A disappointing weekend. Southampton 3, Arsenal 2. Um, it, it seems to happen. It seems to happen uh, year after year. And I'm not going to kick off. I'm not going to start shouting and screaming. But why is it we always make fucking average strikers look like Romario and Ronaldo? I mean, Danny Inns. Struggling all season, pops up and gets two goals. Charlie Austin pops up, scores scores a goal. Our, our defending at times is, is shocking. And um, I know we've been on a run, 22 games unbeaten. Um, we haven't been playing very well. And I think we've we've got away with a few things. And um, I think this weekend, you know, reality check for everybody. Uh, it was a big reality check, you know. Good to see Mkhitaryan getting a couple of goals. Um but overall, it was poor. Poor defending. Because on his first game back, and he looked really rusty. He looked off off the ball. Um, Liz Steiner was all over the place. Morial was over the place. Granit Xhaka at left back. You know, it was it was it was really poor. And for the first time this season, I thought Unai Emery got the the tactics wrong. And um, he's been brilliant this season. He really has, and he's. His, his tactical changes, his formations, his, his in-game management, his substitutions, gives him credit. You know, he's done he's done brilliant for us. And and when credit's due, credit's due. But when people make mistake, you you have to question it as well. And um, for the first time, um, I think Unai got got it wrong. But uh, on balance, I think he has got more things right than he has wrong. So let's just put this as a a bad day at the office. Let's not get too carried away. It's one defeat in 22 games. And it's a process. And I didn't think Unai Emery would come in and did and do the job, the good job that he has done already. So let's put things into perspective. He's done brilliant for us. And this is a process. It's going to take time for Unai Emery to get everything right. And during that, is there's going to be ups and downs and this is just going to be one of those downs but I have faith in the manager and I believe that he will correct uh, all the problems in time it's not a light switch you know Emery can't just come in and, and everything's going to be great within 48 hours it's going to take time so let's not get too carried away now let's get on another run let's build on it let's go again come on the Arsenal And that brings us to the end of another episode. My thanks to every single one of you for tuning in, uh, watching on YouTube or, of course, listening via the audio. Please do not forget to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, comment, share it. Do whatever you've got to do um, to keep supporting us. We really, really do appreciate it. My thanks to Hugh Wizzy for joining me on this week's show. And, of course, to Chris Davis and Mike Stavrou and Mems for their contributions. Um, thank you all so much for supporting the show and for sharing your excellent views with us uh, week in, week out. Um, we'll be back on Thursday, looking back at the Carabao Cup quarterfinal against the Vermin from down the road. Um, and, of course, looking ahead to the weekend's game as well uh, after that. So 
action-packed podcast coming your way this Thursday. Um, I hope to record it when I get in from the game on Wednesday night. Uh, but if we get beat, I might be a little bit miserable and have to wait till the next day. Um, so let's see how it goes. Uh, but until then, guys, take care um, and uh, up the Arsenal.